Yom Kippur that uh, people pay very little attention to, even though it's very important, and that is some aspects of the avoda. Uh, you'll notice that in the Musaf of Yom Kippur, the Chazar Sashats, there's a very, very detailed description of the step-by-step -step service of the Beis HaMikdash on Yom Kippur. And uh, that's very, very important. It's very technical. Talmud uh, Chachamim love it because the, uh, the poem, it's a poetic rendition. You know, they'll point out, oh, this line goes like the Rambam and not like Tosos, or this line is the second answer of Tosos and Yuma. And there are two different, actually there are many, but, but primarily there are two different poetic versions of the Seder of Oda. Ashkenazim say a piyot that begins with the words Amitz Koach, God who is mighty in strength. Uh, Svardim and Hasidim uh, have a nusach that's called Ata Konanta, you established. And they, it goes through basically the Seder of Oda to different poetry and the like. Uh, Svardim should know that Ata Konanta is halachically the more proper nusach. I mean, you can say there are a number of things in the Ashkenazic nusach that do not correspond to the halachos of Avedis Beis HaMikdash. Because of this, there actually were Ashkenazim who said you should say Atok Konanta even if you have a Nusach Ashkenazim. I mean, it's not the way we, we say the Piyot and, and the like. Again, I mean, I don't mean to say uh, every line is different. You know, 90% you know, 80% is the same in both, but there are some interesting differences. Uh, the Seder Avedis is based on uh, the Mishnah and Maseches Yuma and the Gemara and Maseches Yuma and the Rambam and the Bavli and the Yushalmi. And what happened was that in the Middle Ages, poems were made incorporating all of these different halachos. And really, if you ask how many Seder Avodas are there, how many poems, there are actually probably 50 or 60 of them. But as I say, in modern times, you'll only find the Atah Konanta and the Amitz on the Amitz Koach. Uh, one little thing, and I think the art scroll has made a mistake here. Uh, the uh, Amitz Koach poem is attributed to an Ashkenazi Mechaber from in Germany, whose name was Rav Meshulam Bar Klonimus, whose name is spelled out in the acrostic. But then they'll tell you Atar Konanta is attributed to Yossi Ben Yossi Kohen Gadol. So some say that means he actually was a Kohen Gadol who did the job during the second Beis HaMikdash that would make it very, very, very ancient. But I'll tell you why the art school made a mistake. The truth is there are two Atar Konantas. There's another Atar Konanta that is not said by anybody today. And that is very old, and that goes back to Yossi ben Yossi. The Atar Konanta that's in the Machsor is not from Yossi ben Yossi. And it's a kind of the same time as Amitz Koach. So, unfortunately, when you have two piyutim with the same first two words, uh, there's going to be a lot of confusion. Okay. It would be Kedai to go over the Seder of Aida B'Arichos. Uh, what is the purpose of it? Once again, that when there was a Beis HaMikdash, these Korbanos brought Kapara, they brought atonement. Today we don't have the Beis HaMikdash, so we have to do Tshuva, of course. But in addition, when we recite these words, we have the Pasuk that promises us, Unishalma Parim Sifasenu, we replace the Korbanos with what we say. So it's very Kedai to look at the Seder of Oda. Uh, the Art Scroll has a very, very good uh, translation and commentary that you can follow. And uh, for some people, they get bored because it's so technical. But the truth of the matter is, if you spend a little time learning it, uh, you'll enjoy it. You'll actually find that a very enjoyable part of the davening because it's a combination of learning and davening at the same time. Like you're learning about the korbanos, learning about the ritual, learning about the Kodesh HaKadoshim, and the four times the Kohen Gadol went in, and the different confessions, and, and the like. So the Seder Avodah is one of those things that uh, you can really learn to enjoy. And Yom Kippur is a day of simcha, a day of joy, and one of the joys is the learning you can do. There's not much time to learn on Yom Kippur, but the Seder Avoda is something that you can actually learn. So I would urge you to take uh, your Art Scroll Machsor uh, and uh, study it and try to uh, understand what is going on in that way. Um, but I just want to talk about one ritual, because we only have time basically for one ritual. And that is the mysterious ritual of the Sa'ir La'azazel. The Torah requires that the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur designate two goats 
And the goats have to be exactly alike, same age, same color, same height, two identical goats. And he has a box, and there are two lots in the box, two pieces of wood covered in gold. One is marked Lashem, Shem HaMaforish, for God, and the other is marked La'azazel, for the demons. And the Kohen doesn't pick, he basically just picks at random, so to speak, it's of course directed by Hashem. And one goat is designated as the goat for Hashem, and one goat is designated as the goat for Azazel. We'll explain what that happens. When Klal Yisrael is on a high madrega, the one to the right always became the Hashem. I Meaning he always drew up the Hashem in his right hand. When Klal Yisrael was not on, on the high madrega, it could sometimes be the left. But either one. One goat becomes the goat of Hashem, or for Hashem, and the other becomes the goat for the demons. The goat for Hashem is slaughtered in the Beis HaMikdash, or you know, in the courtyard of the Beis HaMikdash, and its blood is brought into the Kodesh HaKdashim. And the Kohen Gadol sprinkles the blood uh, 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 adjacent to the Aron HaKodesh, and he does it one up, he dips his finger in the bowl, one drop in an upward motion, seven drops in a downward motion. And uh, the Kohen had to count in order not to lose track. And that's where you get the achas one, achas v'achas, achas v'shtayim, achas v'shalosh, achas v'arba, achas v'chamesh, achas v'shesh, achas v'sheva. You understand what's going on, in other words. He's counting, so achas. Then he dips a second time. Achas v'achas, achas v'shtayim, right? Seven. Altogether, the blood of the goat is sprinkled eight times. There's also the blood of the, of the bull, which we're not talking about. I just want to talk about the goat. There is a bull and a goat whose blood is sprinkled in the Holy of Holies. But since I'm focusing on the two goats, I'm just doing the goat right now. So that's the goat Lashem. The blood is sprinkled in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. It is then sprinkled on the paroches outside of the Kodesh Akdashim, the curtain. And then finally, it is sprinkled on the golden altar. What happens to the meat of the goat? It is burnt, chutz lamachana. And what happens to the uh, inner fats? They're burnt on the outer mizbeach, right? So there are three things that happens here. The blood is in the Kodesh, well, the blood is in three places. The blood is Kodesh Akdashim, Paroches, Mizbeach Azov, and the rest of the blood in the big bowl is poured on the base of the outer altar. Uh, the meat is burnt, Chutz Lamachana, and the Emurim, the fats and the internal organs, are burnt on the outer Mizbeach. No, no part of it is eaten either on Yom Kippur or even after Yom Kippur. That is the goat Lashem. It is considered to be a sin offering. Now, what happens? to the other goats. So this is very strange. The first thing the Kohen Gadol does is, he puts his hands on the other goat, and he recites a confession of sin on behalf of all of the Jewish people. Oh no, Hashem, Hashem, Shem HaMafarish. Please, Hashem. Chatu avu pashu amcha beis Yisrael. Your, your nation Israel has committed chataim, avonos, and pishaim. These are three types of Averis. A chait is a shogeg, inadvertent Avera. An avon is an intentional Avera, which you did because of taiva. You're very, very hungry, so you ate something treif. Pesha is even worse than that. That's a sin out of spite. You could have had kosher food. You deliberately chose treif food. So that's a Pesha. And the Kohen Gadol asks Hashem to forgive B'nai Yisrael. And then he ends in his confession Ki bayayim hazeh, quoting a pasuk in the Torah, on this day, yechaper aleichem, Hashem will atone on you, letarer eschem, to purify you, mikol chatay seichem, from all of your sins. Now the pasuk ends, lefnei Hashem titaru, in front of God, you will be purified. Right? The pasuk ends, lefnei Hashem titaru, but the way it works is, when the Kohen Gadol said, lefnei Hashem, the shem hamaforish, everybody bowed down. And they said, Baruch Shem Kavod 
Malchusa Liolam Void, we bow down at that point. We bow down other times as well. So because of this, the Kohen Gadol prolonged the recitation of Hashem's name until they said, Baruch Shem. And then when they're still bowed down, he says the last word of the Pasuk, Titharu, which now becomes a bracha, may you become pure in the eyes of Hashem. Right? And as Lifnei Hashem Titharu, Lifnei Hashem, and you shout, Baruch Shem Kabod Malchus Olam Vayed. The Kohen Gadol then says, Titharu, you're pure. Okay, so that's the vidoy on the goat. What then happens is, the goat is then taken by another person. This is the only thing the Kohen Gadol doesn't do. And this gives the Kohen Gadol a break because the Kohen Gadol does not do anything until the scapegoat reaches the desert, which is around two hours or so. So that's the one break on Yom Kippur the Kohen Gadol has. And uh, somebody other than the Kohen Gadol takes the, gate, takes the goats to a desert area around, uh, after, you know, when you leave Yerushalayim, you go south, right? You, you he turns into the desert and the scapegoat is pushed off a cliff and it is supposed to die. And the concept is, if you read the Torah very literally, the scapegoat somehow bears all the sins of the Jewish people, right? The Kohen Gadol transferred the sins to the scapegoat. And when the scapegoat dies, all of the, and that's where you get the word scapegoat, all of the sins of the Jewish people are forgiven. And uh, there was a red thread or a red uh, piece of cloth that would turn white when the scapegoat died. And that was a sign that if your sins are as red as scarlet, Hashem will make them as white as snow. This was the soir. Now there are two names for it. The Torah calls it, and I'll have to explain this, Soir la Azazel, the goat that goes to the devil, to the demons. Now that's a very troubling expression. Chazal did not want to use that lashon because it has a connotation of Avodah Zarah, and I'll talk about it in a moment. So they gave it a much more neutral term. The rabbinic term, the Mishnayic term for this goat, is simply called Soir. Hamishtaleach, the goat that's sent out. You see the difference. The Torah calls it the goat to the demons. As I'll call it the goat that you send out. Either way, though, it's very, very hard to understand. In fact, if you have to ask yourself, what is the most important ritual of Yom Kippur? It's not even going into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. It's the Soir Hamishtaleach. That's amazing. Is the Soir Hamishtaleach a korban? It's not even brought in the base of Mikdash. It's knocked off a cliff in the desert. So what's going on? So, and what does the Torah mean? The goat that is given to the demons. You're giving a goat to the demons? That sounds like a Zorah Mamish. So the Ramban himself notes already that the Koach of the Sora Mishtaleach is essentially a very mystical idea that we don't fully understand. But let me just give you a few things to think about of what the Sara Mishtaleach might represent in our own lives. The first is a thought by Rav Shimshin Rafal Hirsch, uh, who makes the point that the powerful message of the two goats is to remind us of the illusion of freedom. Imagine if you could put yourself in the mind of a goat so we have these two goats. They're exactly the same. One goat gets designated for God. What happens to that goat? His throat is slit and his meat is burnt. The other goat is free to go to the demons, do what he wants. So if you would be a goat seeing what happened to your twin brother over there, you would say, ah, oh, what a bad life that goat has. But Baruch Hashem, I get to frolic, I get to, to walk, I get to run. Right? So the person thinks, when I reject the way of God, I have freedom. I have opportunity. I have joy. But what happens is, that freedom is an illusion. Because it ends in being thrown off a cliff. The other goat may have gotten its throat slit. But the blood goes into the Kodesh HaKadoshim. And it's given a closeness to Hashem. 
So the meditation that this is designed to make me think about is the notion that sometimes, maybe very often, a life of commitment to Torah and mitzvahs may have certain hardships. You can't eat what you want, you can't do what you want, you can't go where you want. There are restrictions, there are limitations. And we can look at people who can seemingly do whatever they want in life. And we might get jealous of them. They have so much freedom, they have so much opportunity. And yet the message of the Sari Mishtalayach is, the goat that goes to the demons, so to speak, the goat that gives in to the Yetzir Hara, in the short term, it may look like a lot of fun, but the end, will just end in a destruction that's not connected to anything spiritual at all. It's not connected to God. It's not connected to Kedusha. And what's going to be? So at first sees this as a wonderful image that reminds a Jew that the way of Hashem may seem to involve sacrifices in the short term, but ultimately it brings you to a connection with Hashem which is meaningful and joyous as opposed to the Sora Mishtaleach, where in the short term, the goat is having a great time, right? Goats love to run around and eat the grass, uh, whatever it is. Do what it wants, Hefker. But that Hefkeris is going to cause its destruction. That, that's one aspect of the Sora Mishtaleach that Rav Hirsch sees. So when it says it's a goat to the demons, it doesn't mean you're offering it to the demons but it represents the wildness and the freedom of the person who kind of says, I'm dedicating myself to my own inner demons of hedonism and you know, joy, pleasure, whatever it is I want to do. That's also called the demon that's within a person. Now there's a second point that other Mephor should make, which actually ties into our discussion of free will. Note that the Torah is very, very makbit that the two goats be exactly the same. They be exactly the same, look the same, same color. Why is it so important that they be the same? On one hand, one goat is kind of the bad goat, and one goat is the good goat, but they're both the same. So the point is, that teaches you something about free will. A person shouldn't think, I was born to be a Russia. I can't help it. I was born with a bad nature. I was born with sinful proclivities. And if this guy is righteous, okay, God gave him a good nature. The Sora Mishtaleach reminds us that there is no <clears throat> intrinsic difference between the good goat and the bad goat. The good goat and the bad goat are exactly the same. And that reminds us when we're, we're on Yom Kippur and we're doing tshuva, nobody should think they were predestined to be a Russia, and somebody was predestined to be a tzaddik. The Russia and the tzaddik are the same. They're the same human being. And it's the choices that a person makes that defines them in that way. So seen in this perspective, the Sora HaMishtoleach reminds us of the koach of Bechira, that there's nothing inherent in a human being that makes one a Russia or one a tzaddik. Every person could be either one. But then there's a sub-point to this. Because keep in mind that the designation of the good goat, bad goat, is not made by the goat. It's made by the Kohen Gadol drawing lots. And this could teach us a pedagogical point in how we raise our children, in how we relate to our Talmidim. And that is the destructive impact of labeling and prejudging. You know, I still, I still remember this. I mean, it, was, it was funny at the time. I guess it was kind of funny that um, I remember like in fifth grade or something. So uh, one of my classmates had an older brother who had been a troublemaker the year before. So the teacher says on the first day of class, he says to the kid, I know you're going to be a lot of trouble because your brother was a lot of trouble. So I remember thinking, yeah, you know, you're labeling a kid on the first day of class. Uh, uh, and of course, the kid did become a troublemaker because he was already labeled a troublemaker and, and the like. Of course, in those days, troublemaking was relatively benign, you know, spitballs. In fact, they had, <laughs> there was a survey about the biggest problems in uh, classrooms in the 1960s. So they said uh, spitballs, uh, water fights. 
then they did the same thing uh, in the 1990s, 2000. It was like, you know, guns, knives, you know. So, <laughs> so, so the, prob the problems kind of change, change over time. In those days, it was a much more innocent age, uh, so to speak. Uh, but whatever it is, the idea of labeling. A person becomes what he is described as being. I look at somebody and I see them as good. I see them as sincere. They're going to want to live up to that expectation. If the image that I convey to them is they're bum, they're no good, they'll become that way. They're not going to be motivated to change. So this you also see with this Sari Mishtalech. The two goats are exactly the same. What makes one goat a bad goat, so to speak, and one goat a good goat? The label that the Kohen Gadol puts upon them. So Hashem is teaching us the way you label somebody becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And by the way, that includes labeling yourself, right? If you view yourself as somebody that is not capable of having a relationship with Hashem, that becomes what you, that becomes your reality. Okay, a person has to also have faith in themselves. Yeah, do you want to say? Um, like there's many cases like in, in the Torah where you can, where Hashem says, says something specifically and overrides the general idea, like, you know, a wrist on Shabbos or putting a hero beam on, you know. So what would be wrong with Hashem's, or what would be wrong with interpreting this saying is that this actually is for demons? Like, well, well, <laughs> well, the problem, the prob well, I, I understand. Uh, the problem is, of, well, I'll, I'll mention, I didn't finish yet, I'll, I'll mention a thought along those lines. But the problem is, uh, you don't find that Hashem uh, ever, ever tells you to bring sacrifices to placate Avodah Zarah. I mean, even things like the Kruvim, so he allowed us to have visualizations, perhaps, but to, to an, an actual korban, uh, a sacrifice to the demons would be Kenega, the idea that God wants to take us away from those sacrifices. Like the Om um, Pesach, we put the blood on the door. To, yeah. And so that the, the Moloch, it affected the actions of the Moloch. So the, the other Moloch didn't, you know, put the first blood in their house. Yeah, but, but that is not understood as some type of magical thing. That's understood as, you know, the... Uh, the sheep was the god of Egypt, and the fact that the Jews publicly put up the blood of that sheep shows their devotion to Hashem. In other words, what protected them was the spiritual devotion to Hashem at the risk of their lives. Uh, and that kept away the Malach HaMavis. It wasn't like a sacrifice to the Malach HaMavis, Mavis itself. So I, I've mentioned three ideas so far, th three uh, interrelated ideas. One is that the path of apparent freedom can often be destructive, and the path of sacrifice to God can, will be rewarding. Uh, the second is that the tzaddik and the rasha are not inherent categories, and that's why they're both the same, but they're a function of free will. And the third idea was the destructive impact of labeling on making a, a, a perfectly righteous or potentially righteous goat, so to speak, become like an evil goat. And that's something we have to be careful about. We have to be careful about labeling. This is very, very important in raising children, in uh, teaching Talmidim, and even in terms of how we view ourselves, to view ourselves in a positive way. Uh, again, this is important because I know that uh, the tshuva season is often a melancholy season where we're thinking about our failures and we're thinking about our mistakes and we're thinking about all the things we did wrong. And yeah, we have to think about that. But we have to think about it in a context that we are holy people. Hashem loves us. There is beauty in our neshama. And tshuva is a joyous opportunity to reconnect to Hashem and to reconnect to ourselves. Again, there's, there's no accident that our chachamim tell us Yom Kippur, together with the 15th of Av, was the happiest day of the year. Happiest day of the year. Not a day of sadness, not a day of, oh, I'm so bad. A happy day. Because in purifying ourselves, there's a great happiness. Every shovel, imagine you had a beautiful palace that somehow got besmirched with all sorts of filth. In some sense, every shovel full of dirt that you're taking away from the palace, you're making it more beautiful. There's something beautiful about it. That's how you have to look at, at, at Yom Kippur. 
Now, there is a final point here uh, by the Ramban, which is uh, a real, real problem. Uh, the Ramban brings from the Mekubalim that, yes, it actually is a sacrifice to the demons that represent powers of impurity in the world. And this is called Shochad Lesatan. Shochad Lesatan means a bribe to the Satan. And the mushal that's given is that imagine that you want to see the king. But the king, uh, the king's palace is surrounded by vicious attack dogs. So anyone who wants to see the king will have to go through those dogs. They're going to tear you apart. So if you're smart, and burglars know this all the time, you keep a piece of beef steak, raw steak, in your pocket. And when the dogs start attacking you, you throw them the steak and the dogs get distracted and that's how burglars can sometimes come in. Now, a real well-trained watchdog doesn't get distracted and hopefully, you know, if you're a burglar, you hope you don't meet one of them. Uh, but the average dog, you know, will go with the meat, go with the steak and, uh, and, and, and the like. So here too, the Ramban says the following idea. There is a Satan. Now Satan, we, we mentioned a few times already, that Satan is not like the Christian Satan, this demonic figure that fights God. But the Satan is the devil's advocate, is the prosecutor in Shemayim. And the Satan is also the Yetzir Hara that he does both. He, he makes you sin or he urges you to sin and then he prosecutes you for it by presenting it to, to Hashem. And he's the Malach HaMavis. It's kind of like the... Uh, police department in these small southern towns. Uh, they give you the ticket and then you're the judge, then they're the judge and then they, <laughs> they, they're in charge of the jail, right? They do everything. So here the Satan uh, does everything. The Satan is the Yetzir Hara, the Satan is the prosecutor, and the Satan is the Malach HaMavis that carries out the punishment at the end. But nevertheless, in spite of this, the Satan is a respected member of Hashem's heavenly court. The Satan has a job. I mean, he has a job. I mean, this is his function. He's not kicked out of heaven. He's not a fallen angel, as Christian uh, lore has it. He's in Shemayim, uh, working with, with Hashem uh, in that way. But his job is to be makatreg, to prosecute us, to bring up our bad points. So the Ramban says he's like the dogs that prevent us from reaching Hashem. So what we do is the same way you give the dog a stake and get the dog off your back, you give the satan a, a goat and therefore the satan is not going to be makatreg and this is called shochad, a bribe that you give to the satan. This is what the Ramban says. Now the truth of the matter is, although it's a very nice marshal, so to speak, but it still doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. I mean, I have, I'm, I'm bribing the Satan, so he shouldn't be Makatreg. I mean, this, number one, the Satan will accept the goat, and, and number two, I mean, uh, I mean, Hashem is aware of our Averis anyway, so what exactly is the notion? Now we do find this notion of keeping the Satan quiet. We find it by Shofar that we blow shofar not only during Musaf, which was the original mitzvah, but even before Musaf. And the Gemara says, to confuse the satan. All right, so there's this notion. So on Rosh Hashanah, the word that we use is larvev, to confuse the satan. On Yom Kippur, we use the word uh, shochad le satan. So we're not confusing the satan, we are distracting him by giving him a bribe. Did you want to say? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> it's interesting. Well, that would be good. I mean, that's what you want, right? <laughs> yeah, but the truth is that I think that, um, well, it depends, it depends what he's doing exactly. Meaning, if he took a bribe, he would be puzzled to be a judge, and he would be puzzled to be a witness. But to be a prosecutor, to simply bring up our bad points, that he could do even with the bribe, because the judge would just evaluate whatever the person is saying. So, so it depends on what capacity, but that, that's an interesting point. So what is the idea of a shochet l'sata? Meaning the Ramban gave a vivid marshal, but ultimately what does it mean? So let me share with you a thought from Rev Dessler, uh, Mikhtam Elio, 
Uh, you know, Rav Dessler was certainly one of the great, great, uh, not just Bali Musser, but Bali Hashkafa, and, and one who had a very, very deep understanding of all aspects of human uh, nature. You know, one of the uh, interesting things about Rav Dessler is that he, was, he drew from many, many sources that many other Bali Musser did not. Rav Dessler uh, drew a lot from Hasidus, <coughs> Tanya and, and the like, where the in fact, some of the more traditional Bali Musser didn't like Rav Dessler's approach. They thought he was bringing in things that Rav Yishol Shalantar was not, did not do, etc. And they thought that he was not a purist in Musser because he was so involved in Hasidus and Kabbalah. But Rav Dessler did bring in Maral and uh, Hasidus and Kabbalah. But the amazing thing is, and this shows you how you master it, he was able to communicate Kabbalistic ideas in non-Kabbalistic terminology, meaning he kind of translated them into ethical ideas and into psychological ideas. And that, 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 that's, that's quite a talent because a person can, who learns Kabbalah, you know, if you know the lingo a little bit, you can express things in Kabbalistic ideas, but you don't apply it in a real way to how a person lives. And Rav Dessler had this ability to translate from Kabbalah into psychology and Musser to extract from the esoterica of Kabbalah a real Lamaisa lesson. And here's what he says. He says, Shochad Lasatan, with all of its mystical con connotations, is also a certain mahalech in how we have to approach our own spiritual growth. And that is the idea is the following. When you have an enemy that you're trying to vanquish, if you put the enemy in a, in a state of absolute desperation, you're actually endangering yourself because when a person is really cornered, they're gonna fight with a tremendous ferocity that you might not be able to stop. I mean, in some ways, this is what Putin is gonna, is, is gonna, is we're facing in the Ukraine because he's losing, amazingly enough, and the problem is uh, the world is much more dangerous when he's losing than when he's winning uh, because when he's losing, in desperation, God forbid, he might do anything, including a nuclear nuclear war. The Ramban says, there's a din in the Torah, listen to this, that when you wage war against the city, you cannot surround it on all four sides. You have to give them an avenue for escape. And you know what the Ramban says the reason is? Because if they don't have an avenue of escape, they're gonna fight with such ferocity that they're gonna beat you. If they have an avenue of escape, they're not gonna fight so hard because they figure out oh, if things get bad, we'll just get out of here. <coughs> so Rav Dester says, the same thing is true with the Yetzir Hara. If you try to totally destroy the Yetzir Hara, it's gonna come back and get you. So let's say a person makes a decision I am not going to allow myself to be distracted in Shemona Esrei for a single syllable. That's going to last around one minute. Because immediately you're going to be bombarded with all sorts of thoughts. Person says, let's say a person doesn't want to have chocolate, he's going to go on a diet. He says, I'm never going to, even believe that, etc. I'm never going to eat chocolate again. Never. So he said that at 12 o'clock. At 12.01, I mean, never. I mean, five years, 10 years, 20 years. I face me, I mean, the rest of my life. And he's gonna have to have chocolate at 12.02. It's unbearable. I'm never gonna speak Lashon Hara. So if Dessler says, when you try to totally destroy the Yetzir Hara, he's gonna win because he's gonna fight back. You've trapped him. So what you have to do is, this is what he calls a bribe to the satan. Meaning, your tshuva strategy gives something to the Yetzir Hara to placate the Yetzir Hara. And then you're able to achieve goals that you're able to. So a person might say, for example, I commit myself to concentrate on the first bracha of Shmon Esrei, and then I'll let my mind wander. So the Yetzirah might let you do that, because the Yetzirah figures, okay, I'll give him one bracha, and I'll get him for the other brachas. What happens is, Chazal tell us 
mitzvah gareres mitzvah. So when you worked on the first bracha, you'll have strength for the next bracha. You see, the shochad l'satan means that in avodah Hashem, you sometimes have to go gradually in which you give a certain bribe to the Yetzir Hara, and that way the Yetzir Hara does not fight you so much. And surreptitiously under the radar, you're able to achieve goals, which will then make you stronger for the next goal. Because if you try to be too ambitious, and you try to trap the Yetzir and you try to say, I'm not giving the Yetzir any room in my life, he's going to come back and hit you. And that, Rav Dester says, is the psychological meaning of Shochad L'Satan. So he's, what, what he's doing is, he's taking a very Kabbalistic, mystical idea, but he's bringing it down as a strategy in our Avodah Sashem that we have to not try to achieve all of our levels at once, but rather we have to go gradually and we have to give a certain amount of room to our Yetzir Hara, right? So a person says, oh, yeah, I'm gonna speak Lashon Hara. I mean, I understand that, but I don't have to do it for the next 10 minutes. 10 minutes, okay. And then what happens is things build, you know, you, you build a momentum, you build a certain, a certain strength, right? So these are some of the meanings of the great uh, ritual, the mysterious ritual of the Sora HaMashtalech. But again, I, I want to just bring out the point that you see Chazal didn't, we're not comfortable with the Torah's term. The Torah calls it the goat for Azazel. Chazal felt that could be misunderstood as an actual sacrifice to the idolatrous, you know, pagan entities. And therefore, they, they turned it to a more parav, a more neutral uh, title. But it's the same thing. Soyer Lazazel, Soyer Mishtaleach is the same thing. The Torah calls it Soyer Lazazel. Chazal call it Soyer Mishtaleach. And uh, of all of the Karbonas of Yom Kippur, the Soyer Mishtaleach brings the greatest Kapara, more than the Ketoros and the Kodesh Akdashim and, and everything else. One, one final point, though. In the Kodesh Akdashim, You'll, know, you'll remember the Kohen does eight sprinklings of blood. Eight of the bull, eight of the goat. We didn't talk about the bull, but eight of the bull, eight of the goat. What is the significance of the number eight? So the morale says eight is above nature because the world was created in six days and then culminating a Shabbos. So the cycle of nature is one to seven and then the cycle repeats itself. Eight represents a level that is above the world of nature. That is why Hashem's covenant, the bris milah, the circumcision, is on the eighth day, because HaKadosh Baruch Hu's relationship to Am Yisrael is above the natural law. Based on historical factors, we should not exist at all. We exist, l'may l'min ateva. So, tshuva too is a miraculous process. Tshuva really should not exist in the natural world. Because after all, if I kill somebody, all the regret in the world is not going to bring them back to life. If I commit an Avera, I've killed something in myself. How do I get revived? How do I get rejuvenated? How do I get forgiven? Tshuva is a miracle. Tshuva is above nature. And that is why on Yom Kippur, when the Kohen Gadol goes into the Kodesh Akdashim, and seeks mercy and forgiveness on behalf of Am Yisrael, it is connected to the number eight because this is a process above nature. And in fact, the Kodesh HaKadoshim itself, even spatially, is above nature. The Kodesh HaKadoshim was a room that is 20 amos, it's a square, 20 amos by 20 amos. Now, the Arun HaKodesh is in the middle. Now it is said, if you measure from the wall of the Arun HaKodesh to the wall of the Kodesh HaKadoshim, you get 10 Amos. And if you measure from the other wall to the wall, you get 10 Amos. Now, how could it be? The whole Kodesh HaKadoshim is only 20 Amos wide, and you have an Arun in the middle, and you can measure 10 Amos from each side. So the Gemara says, oh, the Arun did not take up any space. What do you mean the Aaron didn't take up any space? I could measure the Aaron, and it's, it's, it's two, more than two Amos across. 
But the answer is, when it was positioned in the Kodesh HaKadoshim, somehow the normal rules of physics, of time-space, did not apply. The Kodesh HaKadoshim is kind of a miraculous area where the normal laws of physics did not apply, and that's why it was the place of tshuva, because tshuva too is something miraculous above the normal operation of the world. So I want to wish you all a gemar chasim atayva, good gebench to your, may HaKadosh Baruch Hu be makabel our tshuva, and may all of us be zeichet, and all of Yisrael be zeichet to a gemar chasim atayva. Amen.